peace group's praise and historic visit to Hiroshima by President Obama. But what's been the reaction in Japan? We hear from survivors of the world's first nuclear attack. Seven decades on, is it possible nuclear weapons will ever be used in war again? President Obama has called on the world to reduce nuclear arsenals. But just who's listening? Hello and welcome to this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garza. Seven decades ago, the world's first nuclear bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. The massive ball of fire and radiation killed 140,000 people and destroyed almost every building in its path. Such horror altered history and created so much fear that after a second bomb on Nagasaki, the world has questioned the morality of nukes as weapons of war ever since. U.S. President Barack Obama, on an historic visit to Hiroshima last week, spoke of his desire to reduce nuclear stockpiles while offering his respects to the victims of the 1945 bombing. But despite words of reconciliation and remembrance, Obama has himself failed to reach the targets he set himself early in his presidency. So what impact did his visit have and will his words make a difference? Our newsmaker today is the city of Hiroshima as we hear from survivors. We stand here in the middle of this city and force ourselves to imagine the moment the bomb fell. On a bright, cloudless morning, death fell from the sky and the world was changed. We come to ponder a terrible force unleashed in a not so distant past. もう Mere words cannot give voice to such suffering. But we have a shared responsibility to look directly into the eye of history and ask what we must do differently to curb such suffering again. It wasn't an apology, but Miyako didn't need one. She's buried the pain from the horrors of that day, a day she survived because she stayed home from work with a stomach ache. Obama そういう81-year-old Sunal Tsuboy has made it his life's work to share his story. He was badly burned in the blast and suffers from cancer caused by the radiation. He had high hopes that Obama would be the one to abolish nuclear weapons. 
大川さんがね我々が続婚頑張っても頑張っていて応援するのはプラハプラハ。Today, I state clearly and with conviction, America's commitment to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. After hearing that speech, he wrote to Obama asking him to come to Hiroshima. Seven years later, he did. But not everyone extended a warm welcome. To the leader of the country which spends the most on its nuclear arsenal. For the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they would like this trip to be about nuclear weapons and about arms reduction, but it's really not about those things in any way.、Uh, Obama has committed the United States to rely on and actually increase its reliance on nuclear weapons for 30 years. He's committed $1 trillion of U.S. spending to modernize U.S. nuclear weaponry. The cenotaph in the center of Hiroshima's Peace Park reads, "Rest in peace, for mistakes shall never be repeated." And President Obama stood here while paying his respects. But somewhere in the vicinity, a U.S. military aide had the presidential emergency satchel at the ready, a briefcase containing the codes to launch more than 900 nuclear warheads, with more than 20,000 times the power of the bomb that hit Hiroshima. Today's Hiroshima is a city of nearly one and a half million people. It's been rebuilt entirely. So has Japan's perception of America. It's a modern city with a symbolic mission: to never forget. Inside the Peace Museum, a watch disabled in the blast still tells the time the bomb hit. Tattered clothes remind visitors of the bomb's destructive power. The surrounding park has been built in an open field created by the nuclear blast, which killed more than 140,000 people, mostly women and children. <laughs> Hiroshima's children are all too aware of their city's past. Especially at Honkawa Elementary School, which was destroyed in the bombing, and where peace studies are part of the curriculum. Hibakusha no kata mo don don kore ka shimasu shi, ano naku narareru kata mo oi desu no de, yahari bakushin shi ni ichiban chikai shougakko toshite heiwa o hashin shite iku toyu no wa Honkō no daiji na shime. But the story is not told in its entirety. The school library contains few books about the Second World War. No mention of Japanese atrocities in China and Korea. It's long been a criticism that Japan ignores its uncomfortable history. Now there's new cause for nerves. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is reinterpreting a constitutional ban on Japan having an army. A clause forced by the U.S. after the war. Japan insists it's under threat. North Korea is testing nuclear missiles, and China is building military bases in disputed waters. With the U.S. now focusing on Asia, a visit to Japan's deepest wound helped seal the alliance. But this was an important day for legacy. For outgoing President Barack Obama, and for the people of Hiroshima, survivors felt the weight of history coming full circle. And Sunao Tsuboi got his wish, seizing the occasion to tell the president not to get lazy after retiring. It was especially emotional for Kimye. To see an American president stand before the scarred building where she used to work, where she was meant to be on the day of the bombing, but was running late.
世界に大統領がお参りしてくださったことで発信することができるんじゃなと思いましたこういう機会があって嬉しく思っていますこの意義のある日に居合わせてま出会わせてもらって私はし、まあ、幸せだったねと思います。Well, joining me now from Washington, D.C., to discuss Obama's Hiroshima visit is Scott Harold. He's associate director at RAND's Center for Asia Pacific Policy. And in New York is Eric Dreitzer. He's an independent geopolitical analyst and founder of stopimperialism.com. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Eric, let me start with you. Many survivors want an apology, some do not. Do you feel that President Barack Obama should have apologized when he was in Hiroshima? Well, certainly, I think an apology would have certainly been useful, considering the fact that it is, in, in many ways, one of America's enduring and most shameful acts, the dropping of these atomic weapons, which many experts, including leading historians, now believe was not only utterly unnecessary, but was really a political move designed to spread fear to Moscow for the coming Cold War, rather than it was a strategic necessity. So, obviously, an apology for that would have been important. Eric, you You have 60 million dead lives that are, are, are to account for in, in World War II. If you start with the first 140,000, where, where does it end? I mean, 5 million of those were at the hands of Imperial Japan. If President Obama apologizes for Hiroshima and Nagasaki, then surely the Japanese have got to apologize for the millions that they killed, the hundreds of thousands of people that they raped, and so on and so forth. You see where this is going, right, Eric? At what point do we just have to move on, Eric? Well, I think that it's unfortunate that we have to uh, debate it in that way because I do think that an apology from the Japanese, quite frankly, for uh, the rape of Nanking, for example, would be very much in line with, I think, 21st century values, human rights, and so forth. And I do think it would obviously go a long way towards easing some of the tensions between Japan and China. So I would still reiterate the point that an apology for such a, a shameful act uh, and a wanton uh, act of destruction. Destruction as the dropping of these nuclear bombs was, I think, would have been quite okay. valuable and it would have cemented Obama's legacy further. Okay, an apology for a shameful act. Scott Harold, was it a shameful act? And should President Obama, beyond the gest gesture, should he have said, I'm sorry, we are sorry? Well, that's an interesting question, of course. Eric is right that. Um, <clears throat> History is one of the most challenging issues in the Asia Pacific. Uh, the challenges are, of course, not only with the United States or Japan, as you noted, Imran. Uh, they also deal with Russia and its Pacific legacies. They also deal with what happened in Korea, what's currently happening in North Korea, what is currently happening in China, and what has happened historically in China. I think for understandable reasons that you noted, Imran, The Japanese government was not eager to have this portrayed as an apology, and the U.S. government would not have come if it was, uh, would not, President Obama would not have gone if it was an apology. History is quite contentious in every country, and this was, I think, the most positive, forward looking message that gets us all focused on the threat of nuclear weapons in the hands of states that are not showing themselves to be responsible, and highlights the fact that Russia, North Korea, China, Pakistan are all actively and aggressively modernizing their nuclear arsenals at a time when many of us believe that we sh the world should be drawing down to a more stable yes, but Scott, and reduced nuclear President Obama waxed lyrical about how bad nukes are. You mentioned Russia, North Korea, and these others. What about the United States? The U.S. is spending extensively after decades of neglect to upgrade its nuclear arsenal. These are in many cases weapons that were designed in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, they do require some degree of maintenance, just like any mechanical systems do. And of course, many of these countries are modernizing their own nuclear arsenals at a time when we would like to be, all of us, drawing down our reliance on these weapon systems. What I think we're facing in many ways is a collective action problem. Part of that does, of course, rely on goodwill from Moscow, goodwill from Pyongyang, 
goodwill from Beijing and elsewhere. And in the face of a resistance to that, uh, that kind of a move, uh, it is, of course, imperative that the United States continue to maintain its nuclear uh, capabilities so as not to subject itself to nuclear blackmail, while nonetheless encouraging all states to move in a different and more positive direction. Okay. Eric, are you buying any of that? Not really, no. I mean, with all due respect to Scott, and I certainly appreciate the points that he's making, but this is obvious hypocrisy from Obama. Obama demanding nuclear drawdown, uh, denuclearization, disarmament. He even wrote his thesis in, in, in his master's program on uh, related subjects. He talked about it leading up to his presidency. He even won a Nobel Peace Prize. And yes, indeed, he has presided over an administration which is going to spend or, or have the United States spend more than one trillion billion dollars on the nuclear arsenal that the United States has. So for Obama to demand other countries to do so while actually going in the opposite direction, I would say is deeply hypocritical and in many ways it reflects very poorly. He's taking some heat back home. Is this going to hurt him politically, hurt the Democratic Party politically and perhaps play into the hands of, say, the demagoguery of someone like Donald Trump who wants to act tough? on the international stage, given that all these high-profile people are saying Obama has shamed us by going to Hiroshima, and even though he didn't actually say it, the gesture for them was deemed a capitulation and an apology. So in that context, is that going to hurt him, Scott? What I would say is that I think there is a broad national security community consensus that this move by the president to visit Hiroshima was well received in Japan, is generally well received in the United States. As, I, as you noted, it was not characterized by the White House as an apology, and the president himself did not issue the words, I'm sorry, or we apologize. Moreover, there has been some discussion that it may open the door for a Japanese prime minister, presumably Prime Minister Abe Shinzo, to visit Pearl Harbor in December, on December 7th, the 75th anniversary of that dark day in American history in 1941 when Japan attacked, and it could represent a positive step forward in the further deepening of the U.S.-Japan alliance. So I think in that sense, uh, U.S. policy in, in the form of the president's visit to Hiroshima has been widely well regarded within the United mm -hmm. States, although, of course, there will always, as I said, be people who har uh, would take a different view. Okay. Hold on for just a second, both of you. Stay where you are. I just want to add a bit more context to the, to the mix here to give some more background. The newsmakers Yvette McCullough reports on how Americans' support for the bombing on Hiroshima has evolved over the past few decades. Take a look. Obama's trip to Hiroshima highlighted the divide among Americans over whether or not the U.S. decision to nuke Japan was justified. That divide is nothing new, but it's seen a shift over the last 70 years. According to polls back in 1945, 85% of Americans supported the atomic bombings. But leading officials were at odds with President Harry Truman's decision. Six out of seven top-ranked U.S. generals and admirals thought the war was won before Hiroshima, including Truman's chief of staff, who said in a memoir, The Japanese were already defeated and ready to surrender. Former President Herbert Hoover said, The use of the atomic bomb with its indiscriminate killing of women and children revolts my soul. Nowadays, 56% of Americans approve of the decision to use nuclear weapons on Japan. That's nearly a third fewer Americans who today think the atomic bombings were necessary to defend the US and end the Second World War. So, Eric, a third fewer than before. Clearly, Americans' views have evolved. More and more people are looking at the nuclear attack as a sort of, you know, taboo topic. Many people feel ashamed uh, for it and about it. Well, to what do you attribute that evolution in the, in the American viewpoint, Eric? Well, I think uh, first and foremost, uh, history has brought out a lot of the voices that were suppressed at the time as the uh, package there alluded to. There were voices even in Truman's own administration. There were voices in the military hierarchy. There were obviously uh, advocates of peace and justice and many others uh, who at the time were opposing it. And then history has really brought out all of the historians, all of the chroniclers, many of them who have focused on what exactly drove the U.S. towards this fateful 
political decision. And I think that to a large extent, I don't want to say consensus, but there is agreement among a vast swath of those people who study these issues that actually the driving factor, as I alluded to earlier, was an attempt for propaganda purposes against the Soviet Union to demonstrate what U.S. military capability was in a real-time environment in Japan at the end of the war. I think that military historians also show that the blockade of Japan, the ongoing uh, internal erosion of the Japanese Empire by 1945 would have brought an end to the war in any event, that the dropping of the bomb was not only unnecessary, that it was in many ways a barbaric act that the United States really uh, should be quite ashamed of. And so I think that Obama's legacy would have been really shored up by really addressing that. And I just want to point out uh, what you were asking there earlier. John Bolton and people like that, they represent a very specific political faction in the United States. These are right-wing neocon Republicans associated with the Bush administration for whom everything Obama does is a disaster. Everything Obama does is shameful. This is pure politics that they're okay. playing here. It's not rooted in any reality or objective fact. Okay, Scott, I want to ask you if we actually do need nukes at all to do awful things. Looking at the example of Japan again, March 1945, in one night, the firebombing of Tokyo killed about 100,000 Japanese civilians. That's almost as many as people, uh, as the amount of people killed in Hiroshima. But this was through conventional bombings, right? Should President Obama be visiting Tokyo as well and, and, and saying sorry? Should he be apologizing for that? Again, I, I go back to the beginning. Where do we draw the line and what makes the nuclear attack so special above and beyond all that other wanton killing by so many different belligerents all over the place during World War II? Well, Imran, you're asking really uh, excellent questions. I think in many ways they are questions that historians and analysts will have been and will be arguing about uh, for now until sometime in the future when people don't care about these issues anymore, and I can't see that far into the future. Uh, I do believe that, uh, as you pointed out, there are lots of challenges in thinking through these issues. Where do we draw the line for how far back we go? What's the first move and who responded to that? Often an issue that is associated with justice. Whose side was justice on? Uh, but I think looking forward, you know, the U.S. arsenal today, it does play a critical role. It's a role that's used in the defense of Japan, which is why Japanese leaders don't want the United States to unilaterally give up its nuclear arsenal. Uh, they don't want to have to acquire their own nuclear arsenal. Uh, it's also an arsenal that is used in the defense of NATO allies, including Turkey. Uh, so I think that the real challenge is to say, how do we limit uh, the capacity of these weapons to, or the prospect that these weapons will actually be used in anger or even threatened uh, to be used? Okay, we are running out of time. So one final question for Eric. Eric, you don't want anyone to have nuclear weapons. You don't want this hypocrisy globally, as far as I understand. I don't want to put words in your mouth. But answer this uh, for me, Eric. How can you justify nobody having nuclear weapons or the big powers uh, reducing their stockpiles at a time when a country like North Korea says, hey, guys, here we are, and we're going to nuke our enemies, and we're developing nuclear weapons at a record pace? Surely some more responsible than North Korea actors have to have nuclear weapons, Eric? No, I think that's wrong. I think, first of all, North Korea has made it very clear that if their relations with other countries were normalized, if they were able to actually trade and have access to outside world, they wouldn't be so reliant on these nuclear weapons. They look at the so-called axis of evil under George Bush, Iraq invaded and destroyed. You look at Iran, it's been targeted, it's been isolated up until quite recently. North Korea sees its uh, nuclear arsenal as really its only safety blanket against what it perceives to be U.S. Uh, aggression via South Korea and via its other allies. More importantly, I think that it's incumbent upon the United States as the global military superpower that it is, with military bases all over the world, with strategic missile systems in Eastern Europe pointed at Russia, with strategic missile uh, defense capabilities and missile aggression capabilities in the Asia-Pacific space. It's incumbent upon the United States to begin rolling these things back in order to then demand that Russia do the same, that 
China do the same that these other countries do. Remember, it is the United States that is the only country in the world with a truly global military presence. And okay. as such, it has a particular responsibility to address this issue first before anybody else does. Okay, point strongly made, gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us, Scott Harold and Eric Dreitzer. Today's newsmaker has been Hiroshima, as survivors of the world's first nuclear attack call for an end to proliferation. Last week, President Obama became the first sitting U.S. president to visit the city. He didn't apologize for the bombing, but offered his respects to the victims and said the world must act to reduce nuclear stockpiles. You've been watching this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. As always, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.